In September 6, 1975, Olympic gold medalist Ryoko Tani is born. Shelton Brooks, composer of That Man of Mine, dies at 89. And on NBC, the animated version of a popular live-action franchise premieres. Welcome to That 70s Review. Hello, fellow time travelers, and welcome to That 70s Review, where we look at the shows we loved as kids and you're coming to love as adults to see if they hold up. And this time we're looking at Return to the Planet of the Apes. Return to the Planet of the Apes. He says it a lot better than I do. Now, I've got to admit, if I ever saw this show as a kid, I honestly don't remember it. And believe me, I would. It may still have been in syndication or something a few years after it premiered, and I might have seen it then. What I do remember is that I was a huge fan of the Planet of the Apes franchise, so much so that I owned all of the power records, book and record sets of the series, except for the ones they didn't adapt, obviously. On this day forward, my people will crouch and conspire and plot and plan for the inevitable day of man's downfall, the day when he finally and self-destructively turns his weapons against his own kind, the day of the writing in the sky, when your cities lie buried under radioactive rubble, when the sea is a dead sea and the land is a wasteland out of which I will lead my people from their captivity and we shall build our own cities in which there will be no place for humans except to serve our ends. Yeah, there's really no way to make that kid friendly, is there? By 1975, though, ape mania, for lack of a better word, was finally beginning to wane. Ape mania had begun back in 1968 when 20th Century Fox made Planet of the Apes based on Pierre Boulle's French novel La Planète des Singes, or as it's known in the UK, Monkey Planet, which, you have to admit, is a much more fun title. Despite the movie making several major changes to the book, some of which we'll be talking about, it was a hit, spawning four sequels in quick succession all the way through 1973. Then there was a live-action TV series on CBS in 1974, which only lasted for 14 episodes. And yes, Power Records did a record of that show, too. So I guess it's only fair I eventually look at it, I guess. But how did we end up getting an animated series for a franchise that people seemingly had already ceased to, well, go ape over? Sorry. I just had to do that. I really wish I had a solid answer to that question for you, but there doesn't appear to be one. Why would NBC have agreed with 20th Century Fox to do an animated series based on a franchise when the live-action show based on it had just failed on another network? The Apes franchise didn't have a Gene Roddenberry figure behind it, after all, trying to keep the dream alive, though he did want to keep the money flowing, and maybe Fox did too. Whatever their reasons were, NBC brought in DePady Freling, I've never been able to pronounce that name correctly, to do the animation for the show. Yeah, that company. That company had the good fortune to put Doug Wildey in charge of the production as associate producer, storyboard director, and supervising director. Doug Wildey was the co-creator of Johnny Quest, possibly the best animated adventure series of 1960s hands down, so the project was off to a good start. And rather than tying himself to the frankly kudzu-like continuity that had sprung up around the movies and the TV show, Wildey based the series on the only two bits of ape lore that he was familiar with, and that would be the first two movies. While he did borrow characters from both the movies and the TV show, including Cornelius, Zira, Dr. Zaius, 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 Dr. Zaius,
Nova, Brent, and General Urko, the series' main characters would be entirely brand new, and the storyline would be very different. It would also cleave a bit closer to the original novel, in terms of ape society being more technologically advanced than they were in the movies and TV show, with mixed results. Until the administration can be absolutely sure there are no intelligent humanoids on the planet of the apes. I'm Dick Hutley. And yes, this actually happens. On September 6, 1975, the first episode premiered. In Flames of Doom, astronauts Bill Hudson, Jeff Allen, and Judy Franklin travel 2,000 years into the future. Of course, that raises the question, how did they ever think they were going to get home? But before long, they crash land on what appears to be a desolate planet. And after a long, and I mean long, trek through the desert, falls through a sudden crevice in the ground that opens up and then immediately closes. And the boys never question whether she's been killed or not. Because, again, children's show. Before long, they discover that the inhabitants of this planet are talking apes. Which, of course, we as the audience already knew. They're apes! They can speak! By the end of the episode, they meet a human woman, um humanoid woman named Nova, who has a set of dog tags belonging to an astronaut from Earth named Brent, an astronaut who apparently left Earth about a hundred years after they did. Then the apes attack, and while Nova is able to hide Jeff, Bill is taken prisoner by them, and roll credits. I'll admit, I was initially very excited to watch this show. And unlike other shows I've watched review for this channel, it didn't take long to get through it at all. There are only 13 half-hour episodes, making it possible to get through the entire series over the course of a weekend afternoon. Now that I've finished it, though, well, let's just say I have questions. To begin with, let's take a look at what the show has going for it, and what weaknesses may have kept it from getting the finish that it deserved. One thing this show has going for it at times are the visuals. When the visuals in Return to the Planet of the Apes are good, they are very, very good. You'll notice I didn't say animation there, and more about the reason why later. For instance, this show has one of the most impressive opening sequences I've seen in a cartoon from the 1970s. Seriously, take a look at this. Ooh. Whistling wind, moving fronds, static background. Ah, well. If you're trying to cut down on costs only. What are those? What are those? We're not going to see those in the show, right? I mean, it's a kid's show, so we're not... Ooh! What was that? Oh, it's this guy. Uh, This ape. Yeah. So, oh! Alright, what are these folks doing hanging out around here? Oh my god! Ah! 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 Eyes! Oh! Oh my god! This is terrifying! Oh! Deep fist! Oh, and it got really fast, really fast! Oh! Oh my god! Are we gonna get to see all this? In this show? And it's a kid show? Oh! Return to the planet of the apes. <laughs> Okay, then. (laughs) And by the way, if you recognize that voice solemnly intoning the name of the show, there's a good reason for that. Kitchy, kitchy, coo. Coo Coo-coo. Dano. Barney, my pebbles. Yeah, it's Fred Flintstone. 
We'll talk about him in a minute too, but you get the point. That combination of animation and stills in the opening, coupled with the evocative music composed by Dean Elliott, is truly startling. That's part of the reason I know I probably didn't see this as a kid. If I was running out of the room every time Dark Shadows came on, whenever my sister watched it while it was in syndication, I'm sure I would have been scared to death by this. That gorilla face alone would have scared the shit out of me, and I would have remembered that. This tendency of the producers to augment the animation with highly detailed stills, especially in the first episode, gives this show a much more mature feel than the average cartoon. It's in fact similar to the way such art was deployed on Johnny Quest, giving both that show and this one a very distinctive style. The backgrounds are equally distinctive, which is necessary given so much of this future Earth, and yeah, spoiler alert, they're on future Earth, is entirely desolate. That doesn't always save the show later, mind you, but it makes this first episode and a few episodes later look amazing at times. There are also a few incredibly talented voice actors here, most notably... Bonnie, my pebbles! Yep. That's Henry Corden, the second and most prolific actor to play Fred Flintstone after the original actor Alan Reed. He got to start doing that fairly early because apparently Reed was never able to sing on key, so Corden, who was already doing other voices for the show, was Fred's singing voice. By the time Corden took over the part full-time, with Reed's death in 1977, He'd lent his versatile voice to various cartoons, including Johnny Quest, The Fantastic Four, and in this show as the main villain, General Urko, and, of course, the narrator. The one voice actor with a connection to the franchise already provided the voice of Jeff Allen. Austin Stoker had played McDonald in 1973's Battle for the Planet of the Apes. And Judy Franklin was voiced by Claudette Nevins, who, among other parts, was best known in the 1970s for this. What are you? I am the Empress of Evil, and I command you to summon Electra Woman and Dinah Girl back here. Now that show I do remember. And unlike other cartoon shows of the period, Return to the Planet of the Apes does something that even a lot of live-action shows were afraid to do. I'm looking at you, Space 1999. It had an overarching plot for the entire season. Now, most kids probably would have watched it every week anyway, but having a cartoon series that required you to have watched the previous week's episode was unheard of, and it makes for a welcome change here. It also makes deciding on three must-watch and three must-avoid episodes a bit hellish, but we'll get there. Having that continuing plot allows for a modicum of character development, an individual plotting that, while not always successful, is at least possible in ways that cartoons won't really have again until shows like Star Blazers and Robotech become popular. And this isn't even anime. Unfortunately, some of the very things that make this show worth watching now are mirrored by elements that make it a little hard to sit through. We'll take a look at some of those things when we come back. Mego presents the Planet of the Apes action figures. Dr. Zaius, the orangutan scientist. Cornelius, the archaeologist. Zira, the woman scientist. The soldier eight. And the astronaut. All Planet of the Apes action figures sold separately by Migo. You remember that distinction I made between visuals and animation before? I had to do that. Because while those still shots used in the opening titles and in some episodes of the show itself look like they've been ripped from a well-illustrated comic book, the actual animation doesn't. 
The first episode in particular makes a lot of use of static backgrounds as the astronauts make their oh-so-slow way across the desert. And while that does allow for better jump scares, it also does weird things to the pacing. In other words, the show has some of the same problems that Star Trek the Animated Series had with overusing its static backgrounds, and for the same reasons. They were trying to cut down on costs. The difference, though, is that the basic character designs on Star Trek weren't all that bad, and they were at least consistent. That is not the case on this show. And then there's stuff like this. Hey, how are you doing? Good night for you? No, seriously, how are you doing? Yeah, it gets pretty bad sometimes. Another weakness is in the voice acting. Sure, we do get Fred, uh, Urko, as a reliable source of dramatic acting, but the other actors, including some of the veterans, are relatively emotionless and sometimes just downright embarrassing. That wouldn't be a problem, except one of those voice actors is one of the ostensible leads. The actor Tom Wilson is credited for Bill Hudson, though actor Richard Blackburn, who plays Dr. Zaius, is credited as Bill for an unspecified later number of episodes. Tom Wilson did a number of voice acting roles, though his IMDb page credits him for doing the voice of a lot of babies for some reason. It really makes no difference here, though, because most of the time Bill has only two settings. Dull interest. Look at your watches. According to mine, Earth time is the year 3,979. And near hysteria. Much of the rest of the voice acting is equally uninspiring, even among characters like Cornelius, Zira, and the rest of the apes. The Underdwellers, who are meant to be the underground humanoids from the second movie, sound flat. When the fires destroyed the Earth long ago, we sought the safety of the underground. Our ancestors were forced down into the darkness. We have never returned to the green world above. The apes? Sound flat. And all the secondary characters sound flat. General, who is most important? You want the humanoid or the underdwellers? Unless, of course, they're playing specific characters. And then things like this happen. Gone! All of Ape City's most precious works of art. They're priceless. Do you think it could have been the underdwellers? The underdwellers? Yes, I suppose anything's possible. You also remember how I said that this show is more faithful to the novel, in which ape society is at the same technological level more or less as our own? While in some ways this is a welcome change, since the entire purpose of making ape society primitive in the movies was a budget-saving measure, and animated series aren't really as restrained by such things, it does make for some really odd moments. I'll address some of the more specific ones later as they come up in episodes, but suffice it to say that while having apes with vehicles and howitzers does allow certain plots to work much better, it also creates some unintentional hilarity that the movies themselves never had to worry about much. And that overarching continuity means it's a bad idea to skip episodes because they have to be watched in the correct order. 
Now, I'm told that the episodes are listed by air date rather than their chronological order on the official DVD release, and that there's a difference between those two, though I haven't been able to track down any proof of this. In any case, it's best to consult IMDb and Wikipedia for the correct order of the episodes, much as I've done for this video. Unfortunately, this also means that my normal system of much <laughs> Unfortunately, this means that my normal system of must watch and must avoid episodes won't work here. So for this video, bear in mind that the must watch episodes are simply the better ones and the must avoid episodes are the bad ones. Also, there are potential spoilers in all of them this time. So if you're planning to watch this series, you may want to skip ahead to the timestamp below. In River of Flames, after disappearing in episode one and then being revealed to be alive under somewhat unusual circumstances in the underworld in episode three, Judy finally returns. Yes, yeah, she's gone for this many episodes. She needs the help of the boys to keep a lava flow from destroying the underworld and the humanoid underdwellers living there, and by extension, the entire planet of the apes. Up to this point in the show, the Underdwellers haven't been much more sympathetic than their precursors in the second movie. In fact, we've been less likely to think much of them because A, they think Judy is a goddess named Usa because they find a bust looking like her with USA written underneath it, and B, they've apparently been controlling her mind all this time. But I had to pretend to remain Usa, or Crador would have known. But with this episode, we finally get Judy back, and it's only now that we realize how good a character we've been missing out on. It's not a perfect episode, mind you. None of them are. At one point, Bill and Jeff hide the laser that has become so important by this point in the series, but they hide it in the one place that Urko's soldiers can find it. And then we get this scene. I hate being in the field. At least in the ape city, we can go to the movies. Have you seen that new one, The Ape Father? Oh, God. I haven't seen it, but I hear it's good. That'd be better than this. Yeah. Plus, I can't help thinking that this lava is not the real stuff, but rather the lava light that gets used in Revenge of the Sith, because whether you're an astronaut or a Jedi, you're not going to survive being this close to real lava. But there's some real tension in this episode, and it's worth it to see Urko eat some crow for once, and to have this moment where he almost swears. What the? Into the trucks! In Screaming Wings, we find out that the apes have discovered an ancient airplane and are restoring it, with the goal of building their own air force. To go from a flightless society to one with a warplane capable of wiping out all the humanoids, and more to come afterwards, raises the stakes to the point that Bill, Jeff, and Judy decide to steal the plane and destroy the factory. And who's the only one who can fly the plane? Bill! 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 <laughs> Not this time. Turns out Judy is the only one who knows how to fly planes. Best use of a female character in this show yet. Now again, it's not a perfect episode, and in fact, it's a downright weird one, in ways that don't make sense unless you watch it in context. You'd think, for instance, that destroying the factory wouldn't be enough to put the genie back in the bottle once these apes have found the plane, but these are the gorillas, after all. If the chimpanzees had found it, they would have made notes or something as they were restoring the plane, but apparently they didn't. But Judy flying the plane and even doing a strafing run, not to mention Jeff running a functioning train, is actually kind of awesome. Even better, that's two consecutive episodes that are must-watch, right? In Mission of Mercy, a highly contagious and potentially fatal disease breaks out in the new humanoid encampment, and our heroes realize the only people with the know-how to eradicate it are Cornelius and Zero. While Judy flies into the city to get the serum, Bill and Jeff must go to the ruins of the airplane factory to get more fuel for the plane to return to the encampment. 
And if that sounds complicated, it really is. And yet it works extremely well, with plenty of tension to keep things moving. There are also some more of those lovely stills to show Zira and Cornelius working on the serum. Say what you will about these being a cost-cutting measure, but if they had these in every episode, I'd really have nothing to complain about in this video. Well, maybe not nothing, since this is the episode that gives us <laughs> this. Seriously, I can't stop laughing at that. I had thought seriously of including Trail to the Unknown as the third must-watch, since it would have provided an unbroken trilogy of decent episodes to watch, and it actually provides some of the setup for Mission of Mercy. That being said, if you've watched the first episode, and then the four I've mentioned here, you're almost halfway through the show already, and you've seen some of the best it has to offer. Unfortunately, this show does have a few episodes that simply don't live up to the promise of the rest. Watch these for the experience if you must. But again, spoilers ahead. In Terror on Ice Mountain, Cornelius has discovered a book in his archaeological digs that proves that humans were once civilized and that apes were once in zoos. Given what this proof could do to ape society, and given Urko's sudden interest in Cornelius' digs, Cornelius thinks it must be hidden somewhere. At this point, the episode goes right off the rails, as he also finds the plans for a hot air balloon, which he decides to build since apes have never managed to learn how to fly. That's why they get so excited about that single plane later, by the way. Figuring that he can hide the book somewhere up in the mountains, he and the astronauts build the hot air balloon out in the open, despite Urko's increased scrutiny, somehow, and they end up flying out of control into the snowy mountains. The ice mountains, if you will. It's there that they find... Uh, okay. It hurt my brain to even type this sentence into my script, and it's really hurting it to read this aloud, but here it goes. It's there that they find a secret society of apes that are similar to Tibetan monks. Monkey monks. Seriously. These monks worship the great god Kaigor, a statue of which Cornelius and Bill saw earlier in the episode, which actually lends the episode one of its one good jokes. The ice ape cometh. I beg your pardon. I beg yours. When Urko's men show up on this mountain, though the fact they show up on skis almost makes up for it, Cornelius and Bill take a pilgrimage, using a snow lift, to Kaigor, where they discover that he is not a statue after all, but a frozen giant ape who occasionally comes to life and jumping Jesus on a popsicle? Why didn't they just name him Kong and have done with it? There are so many ways this episode is dumb and awful. Apart from that line of bills, the dialogue is awful. The basket was called a gondola. Gondola? What a beautiful name. Was it a scientist who thought of that, or a poet? Sometimes we had men who were both. The animation is awful. Even the pacing is awful. Seriously, watch this show of Bill's hand on the rope, then all these alternating shots? And this sequence goes on forever. How is it possible to make such a tense scene so fucking boring? Oh wait, <laughs> the first episode did that too, so <laughs> never mind. I do love Zira's almost nonchalant attitude about Cornelius being killed, though. They are lost, Jeff. No one could survive that storm. Poor Cornelius. That does not strike me as the tone of a woman who is distraught that she's lost her husband. Will you help us find our balloon and repair it if necessary, so my friend may return to his wife? Yes, Olama. Please. Zero will be frantic by now. My dude, she really isn't. My 
life. But possibly the worst part of this episode is, if you plan on watching this series to the end, you have to watch it, because everything referenced in this episode comes up again in the final episode. Ugh! Could it get any worse? Why, yes. Yes, it can. In Attack from the Clouds, Ape City is being buzzed by an attack from the clouds. They end up calling it the Bird Monster, because really, what else are they going to call it? And while we're at it, is this Bird Monster the only one of its kind? Is that why the military apes have searchlights when they don't even have aircraft? Come to think of it, if Ape City is the only city on the planet, why do they even have a military? And why? Why didn't I think of all these questions nine episodes ago? <sighs> anyway, after Cornelius and Zira do some frankly embarrassing speculation about the bird monster that now has me questioning their intelligence, much less their sanity... But from its size, I can only presume it's some kind of monster. Monster? What kind? One we've never encountered before. We discover that the bird monster is now attacking the humanoid settlement because the humanoids now have cattle, which we've never seen before. I guess that answers the question of what the humanoids eat, but since they've been shown to be barely advanced enough to build rafts or pueblos without the astronauts' help, how is it that they suddenly have animal husbandry skills? Judy gets to use the plane to buzz the buzzard, <laughs> which is how they end up with low fuel in the next episode, but why didn't it occur to these idiots to use that laser gun on the bird monster? Why is the animation so freaking awful in this one? Why was there no thought put into this episode? Why, why, why? You know what? Avoid this one. It's not just bad, it's a must avoid. Avoid it. Save yourself before it's too late. And then we get Invasion of the Underdwellers, in which Urko hatches a scheme to steal some of the rarest treasures of ape society and pin it on the Underdwellers so that he'll finally have a pretext for attacking them. Thus he stages thefts of such rarities as Cornelius and Zira's first edition of the collected works of William Apespear. I'm not f***ing kidding. William Apespear. No doubt this is the same William Apespear who gave us such classics as Ape Beth and The Taming of the Chimp. It doesn't stop there, though. Oh no. There's also the theft of the Ape Elisa, no doubt painted by... You know what? I got nothing for that one. The leader of the Underdwellers reveals the plot to the astronauts and shows that Urko has hidden all the treasures in the tomb of the unknown ape. Oh, come on! I'm going home and locking the doors right now. Yeah, I get it. Had it not been for budgetary concerns, the original Planet of the Apes movie might have had an ape society similar to this in which the apes, well, ape human society perfectly. Rod Serling's original script of the movie has even been adapted into a graphic novel, and his approach to the same material isn't too far off. But the cartoon has, up till now, been trying to marry the characters and iconography of the original movies and TV series with its primitive-seeming ape culture to the more human-based one of the book, which ends up giving us scenes like this. Now, Mrs. Von Gruen. In your own words, kindly tell the council exactly what you saw with your own eyes and the night in question. I was alone in my bedchamber when I heard a noise. I went to investigate, and then, and then... Now, I have a pretty high tolerance for the absurd. Contact. Contact. Uh, yeah. But this? I'm sorry. I, I, I just can't with this. It seems like the viewers back then weren't too impressed either, as the show didn't get the sort of ratings it needed to warrant a second season. 
the 13-episode run ends with Battle of the Titans, which sees Cornelius and Bill returning to the Ape Monks to get the children's book in the hopes for finally securing rights for the humanoids. But somehow, Urko's men manage to wake up the bird monster and... Well, <laughs> with a title like Battle of the Titans, what did you think was going to happen? The series thus ends without any of the storylines it's built up to this point being resolved, even though the pieces are all in place for some wrapping up. NBC did consider doing a three-episode second season to finish the story, but they decided against it. So, after all is said and done, how does the return to the Planet of the Apes rate? I'd give it two out of five Urkos. Bonnie, my pebbles! <laughs> I might be better disposed towards this series if it had had a satisfying conclusion. And I'm sure there's some die-hard Return to the Planet of the Apes fan out there with the talent to write such an ending. They could probably even use the existing animation to patch it together somehow. After all, Filmation managed to repurpose its animation all the time, so why not? And the show actually has a lot of potential. The scripts are mostly intelligent. They don't talk down to the audience. When the artwork is good, it is shiningly good. And you have to give any cartoon that attempts a single continuous storyline a lot of credit. But it's also got some horrible animation, bad dialogue, often mediocre voice acting, and situations that are ridiculous even given its fantastic setting. If you're a Planet of the Apes completist and are curious, by all means give it a look. But be warned, it's not worth going bananas over. And that's it for this edition of That 70s Review. In the meantime, if you want to see more of this sort of thing, give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, do that thing with the bell that you do, and tell me in the comments what shows from the 1970s that you would like me to cover. Till next time, stay safe and stay groovy. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, oh, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas.